Hey everybody, welcome to another episode. I am delighted today to be joined by Dr. Steve Williams. He is a pediatric chiropractor and he's here to share his phenomenal knowledge with us all today. Steve, a huge welcome to the show. Lucy, thank you so much. I really appreciate being asked. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, me too. I can't wait to delve into this topic. There's so much to explore in so little time. Um, But before we delve in, Steve, it'd be really great if you could share with us just a little bit really about your story, your journey into this fascinating field. Well, yeah, it was an interesting journey. I became a chiropractor because I played rugby against a team of chiropractors and they said, what's that? And they told me. So I said, that sounds great. I'm going to do that. Anyway, I wasn't going to be a pediatric chiropractor. And then I had uh, my own child, Tom, who was born 34, 35 years ago. And um, he had a dreadful delivery. Kind of part of the things that we we see was an induction, which didn't go well. And he ended up being the most screaming, vomiting, refluxy, baby that you, and you couldn't put down. He was just a nightmare. And uh, uh, and I just thought, we've got to be able to do something about this. There has to be something which uh, which can change <clears throat> the, the pattern this is going on because he was, you know, had so many issues going on. Anyway, so I started um, uh, going to all the best people I could in the world um, and traveled around the place and learned everything I could over many years. It, it, pediatric chiropractic was very, very, in its very early days in Europe. Um, and since then, I've become heavily involved in it and ended up putting together a master's degree in pediatrics at the Anglo-European College of Chiropractic with uh, Dr. Joyce Miller and have taught it um, literally all over the world in all, all the um, major uh, countries. And it's absolutely my passion. Oh, you can tell. Uh, I love I love hearing you speak about this. And what I guess it must be so rewarding when you see the difference that your work makes to families um, and to their little ones. Um, but for I mean, I know a little bit about this because our son actually came to your practice when he was just a baby. But for our audience who don't necessarily understand um, what it is that you do with the chiropractic work with babies and, and children, just share a little bit about that for us with you, just in terms of, you know, what, what that does for those exact symptoms you were talking about there as well. So, I mean, part of the thing is with babies is why do babies consult us? Well, they consult us because the parents bring them to us. And what's the primary reason they bring them? Because the babies are unhappy. They're screaming. They can't latch. They can't feed properly. They don't sleep. They um, they wake in um, every you know, every few minutes, um, and they're unsettled. And some of the time I just get babies born, they're just unhappy. This is an angry baby. Well, no baby should be angry. They shouldn't be unhappy. And lots of that is because of what happens to their system. If we think about what happens right at the base of the skull, there's a nerve either side called the vagus nerve. Lots of publicity going on about the vagus nerve now. The vagus nerve lies between two bones in your cranium and just above your first cervical vertebra, the top, the top of your neck. And any disruption in those areas can affect the function of that vagus nerve. And that vagus nerve is the nerve supply to the whole of your gut to get your gut moving and working and working effective in all the gut valves. It's also the nerve supply, the inhibitory supply to the heart. It also supplies the lungs. It supplies all of the visceral system in there. And so much of the thing we see with babies is they're screaming and crying because they have disorders affecting that visceral system and often pain um, being one of the things, inability to clear wind, inability to uh, poo properly, inability to, or bringing up um, vomiting all the time and uh, such things as reflux. And we see those symptoms just time after time after time. And those are probably the primary things that they come in with. But most of the time, the biggest thing that brings them in is just an unhappy baby, a screaming baby that's crying, way more than it than it should be and would you say that this um unsettled vagus nerve even is it can happen to anybody in any situation or is it typical of you know difficult person i had a forceps delivery and a induction i mean like can it be in any case yeah it can can literally be in any case to, to be honest 
because part of the thing is, you know, you don't know exactly what position that baby's head was in in utero for the last three months of, um, they're supposed to be head down in a lovely flex position, but it isn't necessarily like that. And you can't always be certain of that. Um, but often it's associated with um, tr birth trauma. And we certainly see higher levels of symptomatology in babies who have had difficult births. Mm. But it's not necessarily the case. You get some babies who have a gorgeous birth. They have a lovely home birth, you know, four hour labor, everything really nice, pushing and, you know, it was relaxed and baby comes through and then they've got a nightmare baby. They happen as well, but they mm. normally, it is more commonly it's associated with trauma, but some of the time you just get those anyway, and they're still really worth um, uh, seeing because they are, they, there is a reason why that vagus nerve got irritated. And it can be, you know, part of the, a stress response that's occurred from some things that occurred when the baby was in utero. Mm, yeah and I think quite towards the end you do get that kind of thing happening I know with my first there was a obviously some distress going on and there was a meconium inhalation and then and he was stuck and then the second one she was massive she was actually breached for a while turned at the last minute but then wasn't coming out at all and that was an induction and that was quite challenging as well and and then the, the reason they went ahead with the um well, actually, with breaking the waters was because on the monitors, things were looking a little unsettled. It was probably me. I was probably just really fed up. But, um, yeah, I often say there's no such thing as a, a non-traumatic birth. It's all pretty... It's, a, it's an experience, isn't it? And I think... Um, the, the gut as well has become more and more understood as, like, the second brain. And if the vagus nerve is connected heavily with the gut and a happy, happy gut, um, that's going to have an impact on our emotions, um, on all the things you're describing within an unsettled baby. So would you say it kind of, is that where it comes from? Is it gut kind of, does it go to sort of gut first and then? Lucy, I, I love, I love the fact that you brought that up because it's so, it's so, so right. 80% of the vagus nerves are sensory nerves. They're sensing what's happening in their, that gut. They're getting messages from the gut up to the brain and, and then they're reacting to it. So 100%, and that gut is a, is a combination of multiple factors. Part of the biggest thing, you hear this thing, the microbiome these days. What does that mm. mean? It means the bacteria in your system, which are designed to be there. And part of the thing is they, they are actually designed to help you function. So a lot of the breast milk is actually not to uh, act for the baby to digest. It's to feed the microbiome, to establish that microbiome, to make it um, a, a more vital part of the system. And there's a huge amount that, uh, of feedback mechanism that goes with that with the gut. And if we see so many people these days, why do we see so many gut issues? Part of it is that so many people, because of the diet, because of their previous exposure to, to antibiotics and various drugs, which can, can deplete the microbiome, um, mean that the babies are coming into the world without the ideal microbiome you'd like to uh, see them with. And then um, they get issues because of that. And then the feedback between the brain and that microbiome is enormous. And one of the things I say um, is, you know, when you're craving something, for example, you're craving that sweet or whatever, is it actually you craving it? Or is it microbiome telling your brain that you need to start craving that? Because there's a really interesting connection between the microbiome and mood and thoughts and a whole range of other stuff. And we're, we're beginning to understand small amounts of it. And I constantly looking at the research that's being published on this because it, it, it's, it's just fascinating how far, how much that, that, that has to do with our thought processes, our mood, and a whole range of other ability that we have to self-regulate. Mm, it is fascinating. I love this topic. <laughs> and how young and up until what kind of, is there a point that it's too late <laughs> to help a uh, a child or you know adolescent even so like so from from how soon can you make an impact and help and make a difference and up to when kind of age well um i always say that the, the you know if if 
My ideal time to check a baby is a week or two after delivery, if they're doing well. But if they can't feed and they can't poo, they've got to get them in, okay? Some, you know, it's really a question of if they can't feed and they can't poo, things aren't going to go well. And what I so often see is mums who feel awful because they stopped feeding their baby after three weeks, four weeks, because they couldn't do it. And it wasn't about them. It was a baby not being unable to latch properly, being unable to do, you know, create, having a dreadful suck, creating all kinds of nipple pain and, uh, and, and potentially thrush of the nipple and, and infections and, um, and those kind of things because the suck was inadequate. And so the biggest thing I say is if they, can, if they can't feed and they can't poo, we need to get them in. ASAP, because those are the things we can we can affect really, really well, um, in my experience, in those first few weeks. Um, but certainly a few weeks I, I, after birth is a great time to check a baby if it's doing all those things nicely. And then we want to look at um, how they're developing and what their ability to do the various, or at the various times in that, that, hang on, I'm not phrasing this very well, what their ability to um, to be able to do the milestones we expect them to be able to do at three months, six months, nine months, etc. So there's never a time that's too late. I mean, we, 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 we regularly see um, people, children who have had issues as a baby and it's come right the way through and they're now 13, 14 years of age. And you trace those issues back to some of the issues they had as a baby and they've had gut problems and the whole range of stuff since then. Yeah, it's not too late. It's more difficult. Um, but we, we would certainly say it's worthwhile working on them. But we're very, we keep a really careful eye on milestones as being one of the major uh, indicators of how that baby's developing and how, um, how, how it's going to develop later on. And those mm. milestones need to be uh, appropriately met. Mm. Yeah, I can I sort of think back now and I'm like, oh, I wish I'd... I wish I'd come in about this. And I mean, I know obviously we did see um, your team with our eldest and, um, and actually I had some treatment too whilst pregnant with the second one because I think there was some pelvic misalignment after the first and then um, we, we did some work on that. I remember having my bump in a <laughs> the perfectly shaped hole and everything so that we could do some work and it really did help. Um, but it's amazing how retrospectively you can go, well, maybe this and maybe that. And it's, I think, really important for people to know that people like you exist and that you can get get in there quick and make the difference that's going to make everyone's life a lot easier. We say the same about sleep. You know, you don't need to suffer until you're at break point. Like, there is help out there. Um, so Exactly. I and mean, I see so many women who are at breaking point because their their baby is not sleeping and is is having all the these horrendous issues that some of them do mm. um and you're absolutely right they need to search for uh help because there is help available and i think it's just not widely known enough to be honest what you do and what we do but i think it's often not it's not understood it's um the people who know know right but there are so many people that it's not common knowledge that your sorts of support is out there and i think there'll be people wondering what but what do you do like what do you do to them <laughs> what's the well that's, what's a, the, that's a really good them? question uh, and we the, the whole point is that treatment on a on a baby is a very specialized thing and it's not what we do on adults and nothing like it Okay. Most of the, the, the work we do involves very light pressures and very gentle cranial work on re-establishing or establishing normal cranial movement uh, patterns in the baby's head. Remember, all the nerves coming out of the head, so the, the, the cranial nerves coming out supply the muscles of swallowing, they supply the tongue, they supply um, the, the, the vagus nerve, which supplies the gut, and a whole range of other things is massive importance coming out of that skull. So very gentle cranial work on rearranging and getting those cranial plates moving um, after birth. And the pressures we use on that are pressures that you can easily tolerate on your eyeball, much less than rubbing your eye. And if you compare that to a pressure the baby's head goes through when it goes through the birth canal, as a mum, you know what that pressure is like. It's enormous, okay? And, you, and you're really surprised that they, they, they can adapt to it. So 
the, the level of the, the work we do is very, very gentle and, um, and it's very, very different from adult care. We also do quite a lot of work on, again, one of the biggest things we see is symptomatic gut valves. So we actually work on the gut valves and we teach parents how to work on the gut valves and to, um, um, to try and release them and get them working because, you know, particularly babies who are constipated are generally very unhappy babies. And babies who poo regularly tend to be much happier. So it's one of the biggest things uh, we end up doing. And it, it's quite interesting with a lot of babies, it ends up like Pavlo, Pavlov's dog. When I actually work on the baby, they start going as soon as they see me because it's part of the thing they expect to do. That it actually starts stimulating their gut and getting it moving. But that is part of the thing of stimulating that vagus nerve. It stimulates that whole part of the system of activating that, 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 that gut response. The treatments are really uh, are very gentle and uh, very, 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 very low risk. Um, and is that different, the kind of treatment uh, to the cranial work? Is that is that something different or does it? So cr cranial work is a very gentle form of work, um, which is really taking cranial bones into directions of freedom to allow them to move. Some of the classic um, chiropractic adjustment is finding fixed joints and making them move into the direction. This is very different. It's a much more subtle approach mm. uh, to the cranium. We do cranial work on adults as well. There, there, there is... Um, the difference between cranial work on infants and cranial work on adults is really um, size of the cranium and uh, degree of pressure you're going to use. It's going to be much, much lighter on children. It's light on adults anyway, but it's going to be much, much lighter on, on babies particularly. Mm, yeah, we definitely, we had that with, um, with our eldest. And is that, so the cranial work specifically, is that more to do with again well probably to do with the same sorts of pressures and certain things you may have been through for us the forceps delivery um is is it still connected to the vagus nerve or is it yeah well it, 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 in the end lots of the symptoms that babies get are connected to the vagus nerve they're either connected to the vagus nerve uh the the um the glossopharyngeal nerve which sits right next to the vagus and the muscles are swallowing spinal accessory nerve, the muscles of the neck, and the, the hypoglossal nerve, muscles of the tongue. And all of those sit in a tiny little area right next to each other. And they're right on that skull base. And so lots of the symptomatology we see on babies and infants is to do with those. And yes, the, crane, the cranial corrections are very much to, to do with that. Obviously, what we tend to get these days is a lot of babies exhibiting what we could term positional preference which is, you know, they lie with their head rotated in one direction and they have that preference to that. And if they have that, that's usually a dysfunction of the upper, uh, upper neck. And then that leads to flattening of the head more and more and they get skull asymmetries. And then we do uh, work to try and correct those skull asymmetries as well, because we see an awful lot of that um, uh, these days, perhaps more than I've ever seen in my, in my, in my career. Wow, really? Why do you think that happens? has increased um it's an interesting one i think probably that, that there are there are there are a number of factors um it's possibly that um children are more vitamin d deficient than they were that tends to soften bone and mean it mean it's more malleable um there's some interesting theories that like glyphosate may have an interesting effect on connective tissue uh, the weed killer because it's a glycine based weed killer and the glycine is the most numerous amino acid in connective tissue that's a theory nothing more but part of the thing is the way we care for babies um, in the fact that we put them on our on their back and the back to sleep campaign has it made a massive difference in cot death when I, my children were young the recommendation was front sleeping yeah. okay which increased the the content and of course the back to sleep campaign and i'm not arguing with anything about that but one of the things is uh i'm very much in, in favor of mums for the certainly for the six month six months first six months trying to keep the baby on them and upright and using some sort of um crib, carrier. You know, carrier of some mm -hmm. kind or wrap whatever whatever works for them whatever they like because then they co-regulate with the baby. The baby can hear their voice. It, can, it, it gets the vibrations through. It can hear their gut. It can hear their breathing. It can hear their heart rate. And really babies 
we can look at them as, you know, that one of the descriptions is in the literature is they're an extra gestate fetus, which means they, they can't self-regulate. There's nothing they can do for themselves, certainly for the first six months. And they need to be really on the mum. The dads can help. They can do part of it. No question. I'm not, I'm not excusing them or the partners can. Um, but, you know, they need to be on the mum a lot of the time. And that, and that really, that, that's, that regulation can often really help a lot of things. And that, that will mean that they're not immediately lying in that position all the time, that they're actually uh, on the mum for a, for, a, for a lot of those things. But, of course, you know, if they're going to be left by themselves, they've got to be on their back. You know, that's yeah. the, the, the safe way of approaching it. Yeah, we find, you know, with teaching things with sleep, it's it's tricky because I agree with you and massively advocate you know, getting them in a carrier, taking them for a walk. It's good for everyone's well-being. Um, but then there comes nighttime and it's important to be able to put them down, to be able to get your own sleep and for safety because we don't want to be falling asleep with them on us or you know all the other risks that come into that um and then of course little ones don't want to be put down because all they know is being on you and that's why we teach some really lovely um techniques that help to ease that alienness of being placed down and having that lots of hands on and the familiarities of that closeness so that it yeah it's just not so strange for them and then we just can ease up on that as they get more comfortable with that but that is i think that is the challenge and i think it's yeah, it's important for parents to understand that they can do both. <laughs> you, can, you can do both and that, you know, it's not a case of, well, if you if you carry them, then you're going to make a rod for your back at night time. It's like, you can do both. It's okay. Yes, you can. And, yeah, and, yeah. and you should do both. Yeah. <clears throat> and I agree yeah. with that. And if we look at <clears throat> one of the things I, I like us looking at is looking at the, the, the so-called primitive peoples of the world, which are still, there's a few of them still in existence. I think we're primitive to what compared to them in, in the majority of ways, to be honest. <clears throat> but when you see how they look after their children, their children are part of that family group and part of that interaction the whole time. And exactly this, hands on them when you put them down and all that kind of stuff, they're next to you, they can hear your voice, they can, they can co-regulate with you because they're mm. next to you. Yeah. Um, and I'm not I'm not keen on them being put in another room too early and stuff like that. They should be right next to their mum. Those those little um, beds that attach to your bed, those little yeah. cots which are attached, they're, they're just great because they can you they feel your breath, they hear it, yeah. they all that kind of thing, and that co-regulation is there. Yeah, I, I love that we have those now and they, they weren't even around when I had mine. They, they're really quite new, these next to me's and what a great invention because back when I had mine, it was probably most typical that they'd be in a Moses basket kind of at the foot of the parent's bed and that's about as close as babies were in the parent's room. And now that feels like, oh God, I wish I, you know, <laughs> wish I had those things. Like you say, and I love the phrase co-regulate. I love that. I love that you're using that because we talk a lot about helping little ones once they're a bit older to slowly develop an ability to self-regulate and they need to do that in time. But it's like learning to ride a bike. You don't just go without stabilizers first go, you know, it takes time, it takes practice, it takes assistance and support and eventually they get it. Um, but I really love that idea. It's not a case of that they can't regulate and then they've got to suddenly do it all by themselves. You, you, it's a co it's a co thing and it's a mm. gradual thing. We mm. gradually, as they become more able, as mm. they become more active, as they start lifting their heads up, as they start gaining those things, they're able to self regulate more and more. Yeah. And that's the, that, 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 but that, for those first few weeks, certainly mm. those first couple of months, that is the most, that's the time when we need to be very much with them. Mm. And I have to say, it wasn't the way we did it. And, no. um, and I regret it, you know, yeah. because. 34 years ago, the recommendations were very, very different. And, I, yeah. and my, my experience in this area wasn't what it is now. Mm. And, um, <clears throat> and I was learning and I did my, we, we did our best and the kids to, uh, uh, are great, but I would have really, really um, liked to have had more of this thing of actually that co-regulation early is so important. Yeah. And that's, I think that's the thing with hindsight and with knowledge, you know, we did the best we could do with the knowledge we had at the time and as did our parents and their parents. But I think this is where 
we often talk to parents and say how, yeah, the well-meaning grandparents are going to tell you how they did it, but and that's fine, but they don't know or didn't know then what we now know. And, you know, perhaps we will raise um, karma and... I don't know if there's anything wrong with with our, our, our generation or, or our children, but the um, the ability to instill this from a really early stage is just fantastic. And I, yeah, I wish I knew more about this. Um, yeah, you know, no, I, I, t- I, t- I, I, I totally agree. But, you know, the, in, in, in the end, we want children being able to express um, themselves and being and being able to, be close to their parents early and then gradually, gradually, gradually learning yeah. um, to regulate for themselves. And that, that is but the biggest thing I always say to the mums is, you know, you know, if you listen to that voice inside you, you know, there have been um, hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution getting us to this this space. And women have learned these things. And, the, and most mums will actually, if they actually look inside, know what feels right to them. And yeah. that's part of the thing that they need to listen to. Yeah. And but whereas the siren voice is going, going all, all, all around and not necessarily where they, where, where they need to go. But I, I'm, I'm convinced um, that internal thing is is pretty good in, mo- in, in most women if they can yeah. get there to listen to it and not convince themselves that they're, that they're wrong. That's right. And to also tune into, well, if, if something feels off and you're not sure then seek the answers because yeah. they are out there, not on social media or, or not to Google, but, you know, yeah. find, find, you know, talk to people and find who has the answer for you. Like I wish I had spoken to people um, around breastfeeding and latching. I wish I had, you know, there's so many things that I wish I had accessed and been able to course correct um, that I can only now see with hindsight that could have been better. Um, my eldest was in neonatal after a difficult delivery, biggest baby in neonatal, but um, he wasn't with me. I didn't know any different first time. I was just like, okay, he's there. I'm here in this room. What's good? Now I'm like, whoa, wait, I should have insisted on being there. I feel, I feel awful that we weren't together that much. And then we were in transitional care, which was okay, but difficult. But nobody gave me any pointers or it was just just kind of left to it. And I, I really wish he's fine. It's all fine. But yeah, and I think there's also a lot of scaremongering. And I think parents could, um, be, and I you know, wouldn't want anyone to feel scared. So could listen to this kind of thing or other things they see or hear on the Internet and feel worried or paranoid about, being perfect and about getting everything perfectly right when we know that you know like I say I can look back and go well I wish I had this and I wish I'd known that but actually everyone's great and everyone's super healthy and we're all fine so it's just I guess about optimizing the things and being able to pass that knowledge on is is I love the way you phrase that Lucy optimizing is exactly it but of course there is this thing, maternal guilt thing, and, they, and mm. it's one of those things. I'm quite convinced it's got to be some, the strongest of the survival reflexes that you feel guilty about everything, so you do everything you possibly can for that child to ensure their survival. You give up your food, you stand in front of a, uh, a, a loaded gun for them, anything like that. And that maternal guilt is a really, really strong thing, but it can be a bit of a negative thing for people yeah. at, at times as well because they feel guilty about everything. Everything, even though it it's never not, goes not away. Being, not in their control. <laughs> and that, that sort of earliest time you, you had with your child in, in the hospital, I think that's changed quite a lot now. I think they do uh, encourage mums to be part of it because they realise how much that co-regulation is important and that mum's mm-hmm. voice next to them and, and feeling the mum's hands on, on the baby and that kind of stuff, how much that improves their yeah. outcome. So so I'm ho- I'm, I am I'm think it has. My Probably experience has, of people yeah. who've been through it is that it's 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 now they, they encourage that much more than they did yeah. um, because, you know, they thought, oh, that's a baby, we take it away. Well, no, that, that's a baby that's co-regulating with this, this mum mm-hmm. and actually ideally outside the thing of keeping the baby alive initially is the mum needs to be with the baby as much as she can be. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm for glad both that, her and the baby's sake. Yeah, I'm glad that has 
and probably has changed um because I know that had somebody been there to say to me who had no idea first time round, you know, right, you need to be here and this is where you'll be. And oh, we just need to do this with him. But it's OK, you be you can stay right here. I was just kind of summoned to feed him. And then, oh, we need to we need to put him in here now. And it's like, oh, what, what, what do I do? What, you know, it's just I felt very lost. And um, that probably did lead to some of the feeding challenges that came after that and so on so yeah no doubt and I think um this is why this this conversation needs to be had more yeah. and more so that people understand um and also just kind of going back to what you were saying as well with the co-regulating and the initial attachment I think I'm really a big advocate for healthy attachment and it's from that place of healthy attachment where they feel so safe and secure that they are sooner ready to explore the world. And I always picture like a, I don't know, under two year old, but you know, young toddler, at maybe a little baby group and they're there with you and they, they like want to crawl across and look at another toy or a child, but they're kind of checking that you're still there but they feel safe to go and do that because they have that healthy attachment as opposed to the child who will not let you go and as you know, stuck to you like glue because they don't have that same healthy attachment. And um, I, I, I think, I think the, 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 this kind of thing will make a positive difference with that. Mm. When we do see these sort of attachment issues in babies, sometimes there's explanation for them, sometimes there isn't. Mm. And you get, you get mums who do what we would regard as all the, appropriate things and yet that child is still over nervous and over attached and stuff like yeah. that and that can be due to a, a range of other uh things uh sometimes stresses in the pregnancy and stuff like that can appear to fire up their their uh, um their system and some of their reflexes linked to those uh, those kind of things so it's a it's a really fascinating area it's an area i have a mm. huge interest in yeah um, because we see so many uh, children who have problems with it and mm. I'm, I'm, I'm the last thing i'm going to say is that these are mum's fault because generally they're not they mm. are often um, yeah other things which are which are occurring because it's another thing just to make mums feel guilty again which well we exactly there's enough of that yeah like i really yes. don't think that ever goes away my own mum tells me every day i see her like there's something she still feels guilty about <laughs> like, yes. stop yes. let it go <laughs> nothing to feel bad about well yeah, i just think it, it, it's it's obviously a human thing that's created yeah. the survival uh mm. for for us and it and, and it and it is one of those things that you get so strongly even though you don't think you're necessarily going going to get it you do become that it becomes part of you do you know something um this may or may not be part of your expertise but you've just reminded me of this with survival um you know how I think this happens in the animal kingdom as well when a um, the young is separated from the mother and they have the the pheromones that they release and that smell just attracts you to them. I had a really strong that was really strong with my eldest because we were taken apart at the beginning at the early stages and oh my goodness that smell from his head and it wasn't the same with my second but then she never left my side and I don't doubt that that chemical reaction is there to keep the mother close by, right? Is, am I onto something? So do I. I think that's absolutely <laughs> the case. We are no different to, mm. the, the, is that well, we're, we're a little bit more, if you like, developed or evolved maybe than, than the animals. But, you know, you're absolutely right. Those, those kind of things are mm. there. And I'm sure that was the case. I'm sure he was putting them out. He didn't want you to go anywhere there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, after that, it's a uh, yeah. It's 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 a really interesting one, isn't it? Mm. And uh, mm. um, and and there is lots of research going on, certainly in the animal kingdom and the human stuff about those type of smells, those type of pheromones, those type of communication. Mm. Um, it's rather like you know, the, the, there's lots of research about um, how babies communicate with their mums, ordering out the food they need via. Yeah. Uh, the, connect, the connection with the, um, uh, the, the mum's nipple and, or, or, and getting what they need ordered down the, uh, um, the, the food chain, if you like. Yeah. So there's some just fascinating stuff going on. That, 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 that there is extraordinary communication going on that we don't even sense mm. most of the time. Yeah, no, it is. There's a whole world of, 
yeah, a whole world to explore of um, fascinating things that we don't even know we're doing. And yeah. so just one other thing I'm just curious to explore is with what happens in birth and, and how babies come into the world, is there anything in that that can lead to sleep-related breathing disorders or is that, I know I understand there's a certain amount of hereditary thing that can be happening there. Um, and does the work that you do chiropractically have a positive effect on? That is such a brilliant question. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a brilliant question. And uh, well, it's, it, it's a very interesting one from someone like me who has been a previous sleep uh, issue with a problem with sleep apnea previously, which I, I'm largely got, got, uh, got stabilized and sorted now. So yeah, there's, there, there's some really, really interesting stuff uh, on that. And I work with uh, so many breathing issues in children because one of the things we see is a massive amount of mouth breathers. Yeah. If you have a mouth breathing child, baby who's like this child and lots of baby, why, why do they start mouth breathing? Well, part of it can be that their, their cranium is compressed, the breathing tubes are small, but that's less likely than actually they get bunged up from, from a cold or whatever. And then they just get in the habitual thing of breathing through the mouth, which is not the ideal way. And of course, that then if you start breathing through your mouth at night, that, that leads to a whole range of other things um, coming from there. So ideally we, we work with mouth breathers, but yes. And one of the things we, we do with that cranial work and also normalizing the function with the vagus nerve, the vagus nerve is so heavily involved in, in, uh, so many of these things. It's also part, you know, involved in the, um, parasympathetic supply for the respiratory system. And there is a great deal of, um, uh, involvement of that cranium within that. And now, and for example, if ba babies or infants have a very narrow arch, narrow upper arch, that tends to mean that they don't, their, their nasal uh, pathways are smaller, more difficult for them to uh, breathe. And so they will be more prone to opening their mouth and to mouth breathing and then getting into that dysfunctional breathing pattern. So yeah. there's, there's a range of ways we, we work on them. And we, yeah, we work with um, some um, uh, some lovely dentists. And, um, one of we've got a mutual friend is one of those um, um, who are able to use some really, really lovely new devices to um, allow them to naturally expand and to improve their uh, arch sizes and to uh, mm. enable. Because one of the things we're seeing is. The, the excessive crowding, the upper crowding of the teeth, yeah. and it's becoming more common. You know, we're, we're, we're seeing kids get their teeth, get various teeth removed and their braces brought down. And that creates, well, it's not created it, but it's aggravated the narrowness. And part mm -hmm. of the thing is, well, what do we need to try and avoid that? One of the biggest things is to breastfeed. That movement of the tongue up and down into it. Normal tongue patterning, normal tongue movement is really, really important. And children, babies who get a dysfunctional birth will often have an abnormal tongue movement. They have a tongue thrust, sticking the tongue out, the tongue sits in an abnormal place, the arch will develop abnormally. Mm. And they, or the, if they won't develop the arch appropriately, um, mm. if their tongue isn't sitting where it's meant to, uh, on, just on the upper part of the hard palate, and every time you swallow and um, bring food, you know, get food down, that should be pushing up and encouraging that arch development. So there's a whole range of things we, we look at. And tongue dysfunction, well, one of the earliest th things we see in tongue dysfunction is dysfunctional feeding. Right. Okay, and babies mm -hmm. who don't feed well from very early can be on the early part of that dysfunctional feeding, which then can lead to a whole range of arch development issues and um, and then breathing issues and um, stuff that occurs later on and mouth breathing and stuff. So the ideal thing is if they've got a dysfunctional feeding pattern of any kind that we need to get work on that. Um, mm. And um, and we, we, we work with that. One of the lovely things these days is that there, there are um, lots of lactation consultants, breastfeeding counselors, whatever you want to call it about, who are doing work with this mm. um, as well. And that can be really, really helpful. 
Yeah, that's the tongue's such a strong muscle, isn't it? And I think that's the thing. If it's not sitting where it's supposed to um, in that upper palate, like you say, the narrowing and the crowding. And for, for many of us, you probably wouldn't notice this until they are much older and you're seeing all the teeth crowding and other things and the mouth breathing. Um, but to relate it right back to the early stages of feeding, you can really catch those, early, like you say, early signs. Yeah. Um, before yeah. it becomes more ingrained. And, and mum needs, mums need to realise the majority of the time they're struggling to feed, they always think it's their fault, that there's something mm. wrong with them, their feeding. 90% of the time it's not them, it's the baby. The baby's yeah. got some sort of reason why it can't feed. Yeah. Okay, and you know the mum's technique can be part of it, and you know that's where you know breastfeeding consultants are really helpful. They can help with technique and all those kind of things, but it isn't the only thing. There is also that is that tongue able to actually create that vacuum? You need a significant vacuum to draw uh, milk yeah. down from the uh, from the breast, particularly in the first few days before the, you know you, you get that real um, you know milk letdown. Uh, yeah. A little later, when some of the time the baby's gone, you know, yeah. uh, getting, getting too much um, down there. But you no, know, the baby needs to be able to work to extract milk from the breast, and that's one of the most important uh, important things. And that's things I'm really passionate about us making sure that babies can suck and feed properly in those early days, because I think that will decrease the amount of other issues we see later on. Yeah. And I think it's important, like personally, from my own journey, I think it's important for moms to understand that it it's not, it isn't just easy. It isn't a case of you just pop the baby on the breast and away they go. It's actually really blooming hard. And so if you don't find it easy, you're completely in the realms of norm. And it's, you know, getting some support with that is... Yeah, getting some know. support, absolutely. And actually... It's not not getting stressed with it because as soon as you yeah, get stressed, like, you know, then it, the baby feels it, and, the, yeah. and everything go, go. The baby gets stressed, and then the whole thing can can start escalating. So yeah. early intervention with that yeah. uh, is really important with whoever you see. Yeah, um, and knowing that it's not that you're not broken, they're not broken. It's just it just needs some practice and some work, and then it's it. Yeah, I feel like um, I wish that was something that we just all had as part of the process before leaving the hospital. <laughs> it was just a, and this is what we do, and get this right, and then off we go. Yeah. I'm quite convinced it would save the health service a lot of money yeah. and other things if we did look at the early stuff you can do to change a lot of these patterns which are then ingrained later on because I, yeah if we get if we get feeding issues and you get gut issues in young babies they will tend often to be the ones who get some stuff so ibs and various other things later on and of course we want to try, try and prevent that if we can get into it early yeah. get those things sorted get the microbiome maximized mm. in that uh, in those early days if you can maximize that it's a, like a health insurance for the future. And so if you're listening to this and you've got a child that is older and you didn't get in there early and you're now looking back thinking, oh, OK, that could be why my child is doing X, Y, Z. And they're, you know, whatever age, 10, 11, 12, whatever. Um, is there still something that you can do that can yeah. help? There's lots we can do to number one. A lot of the time, if they've had a vagus nerve problem, then they've still got a, you know, uh, the potential for a vagus nerve thing. So what, one of the things is normalizing that cranial function, normalizing their skull base can help, can improve things. Opening up, uh, encouraging sinus function, encouraging sinus drainage, encouraging all that, all that to work. Um, and then looking at their development, because what we see is a lot of um, uh, babies, if they develop, say, slowly, if they miss their milestones, Mm. And lots of the babies who get a difficult delivery will be the ones who will tend to have be slower at their milestones for sitting, for crawling, for rolling over, and all those kind of things. And those milestones are so, so important <clears throat> that they will often be the ones who get issues later on with mm. things like back pain as a uh, uh, as mm. headaches, back pain, those kind of things are incredibly common in, in children and often ignored because a lot of the children think it's normal. Well, if they have back pain every day, they accept it as part of their life because that's the normal thing to them. Um, 
I mean, it, it, it's a it's a very interesting thing when you if you ask your child, it's worth asking because the, the levels of those kind of things are huge. But then it's also those developmental uh, things can link into a whole range of um, uh, ability to learn and ability um, to develop uh, emotionally and a whole range yeah. of stuff into uh, later on. So it, it, it has a complex range of stuff, which is probably not what we need to cover now because the no. whole range of things I could look at about when we get reflexes that are abnormal, those primitive reflexes which get retained later on can have a whole range of issues. And I spend a lot of my time dealing with the consequences yeah. of the infant stuff later on. Yeah, I bet, yeah, in adulthood. <laughs> yeah, very yeah. much so. Yeah. Oh, it's fascinating. There's so much, so much more I could talk to you about for hours. But honestly, Steve, this has been such a fascinating conversation. I'm really grateful for you to spend your time and sharing your knowledge um, and helping us as well to together share this message and this important information with any parent and new mums and new parents who will have no idea like I had no idea about this this kind of thing um and to help us all get our little ones off to the absolute best start in life and optimize their health and well-being optimizes exactly and Lucy thank you so much for the work you do I'm so impressed with it it's great stuff and <clears throat> helping parents who have those sleep issues I had such severe sleep issues with my first child that um I would have uh, uh, love to have uh, um, seen someone like you then it would have been great it's so important it really is for all of our you know our mental well-being our happiness and our um, ability to parent well so totally totally yeah. oh thank you so much steve and um, we'll definitely be putting a link to you and um your work and your practice in the show notes so anybody listening that wants to delve in and learn more about steve then the links will all be there thanks again for joining us today Thank you very much and have a good one. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.